The committee will come to order, and without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the committee at any time. We welcome everyone to this afternoon's joint oversight hearing of the House Committee on the Judiciary and the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform entitled Abuse of USPTO's Telework Program, Ensuring Oversight, Accountability and Quality. And I will begin by recognizing myself for an opening statement. The purpose of the United States Patent and Trademark Office is to promote innovation and ensure the integrity and advancement of intellectual property rights by thoroughly examining applications and issuing quality patents and trademarks. Recent years have brought a great many positive changes to America's patent system and the PTO. Many of these were spurred by changes in law that were championed by members of the Judiciary Committee. One of the two committees responsible for conducting this joint oversight hearing today on allegations that relate to abuses at the agency. The PTO's telework program has been widely acclaimed as a model for the public and private sector in recent years. Proponents have cited a number of important benefits that are attributable to the agency's teleworking program. These include modernizing and improving the agency's workforce, reducing attrition and the life cycle costs of examiners, enhancing employee quality of life, and diminishing the agency's need for space and rental expenses. It is evident that telework and other flexible work programs, when properly managed, can pay enormous dividends to both employers and employees in terms of increased productivity and job satisfaction. Until this summer, there seemed to be little reason to question whether the PTO's senior leadership has been doing an effective job of properly managing its workforce, which is now dispersed throughout the nation. Cracks began to appear in that facade, though, in late July after the Department of Commerce Office of Inspector General published two troubling investigative reports. The first focused on hiring practices at the Trademark Office, where a senior official resigned shortly after a finding that she repeatedly assisted an individual who was apparently not qualified to receive a Federal job at the agency. A second inquiry focused on the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, or PTAB. In that case, the OIG found that the lack of work for paralegals resulted in waste totaling more than $5 million and that senior officials were aware of the situation for years and failed to take action to prevent further waste. The OIG noted, USPTO management provided over $680,000 in bonuses over a four-year period even when the paralegals who received these bonuses did not have enough work to keep them fully engaged. Notwithstanding the absence of work, 95 percent of paralegals reportedly received the highest performance ratings. Subsequently, the PTO announced it made structural improvements to the paralegal program and it was evaluating ways to eliminate their underutilization and revise the way their performance is measured. To date, though, there doesn't appear to be any effort at the agency to recalculate the bonuses paid during this period, many of which the OIG regards as improper payments. Two weeks after these reports were released, the Washington Post published an article entitled Patent Office Fil Filters Out Telework Abuses in Report to Its Watchdog. That article described numerous instances of alleged employee misconduct and suggested agency officials may have revised an initial report to conceal possible abuses and mismanagement in yet another program, the Patent Examination Telework Program. Employing nearly two-thirds of the PTO's workforce, the patent examination program is at the core of the PTO's operation. It has doubled in size in less than a decade as the PTO has grown from one office in Alexandria to include satellite offices in geographic areas as diverse as Dallas, Detroit, Denver, and Silicon Valley. Approximately half of patent examiners now work from home full-time. Another one-third work from home part-time. This includes some 6,500 employees. There is little doubt that the overwhelming majority of examiners are hardworking, honest and professional. However, the agency concluded in its initial assessment that there are, quote, multiple instances where there was evidence that an employee was potentially engaging in time and attendance abuse. 
yet management would not allow a thorough investigation. Nor would management allow records to be used as evidence in a disciplinary or adverse action. This is disturbing and calls into question the objectivity and reliability of subsequent statements by PTO officials that there is only evidence of isolated abuses and no conclusive evidence of systemic abuse. From my perspective, the issue is not whether telework should continue at the PTO, but rather under what terms and conditions it should operate and whether it is being properly and effectively managed. In addition, today's hearing will touch on other issues that are currently the subject of investigation at the PTO. These include the effects of mortgaging or work credit abuse and end loading on patent quality. The IG has indicated these practices may present systemic issues as well. Finally, we will explore the extent to which allegations of time and attendance abuse are not unique to the telework environment, but instead may derive from the manner in which the PTO measures performance and conducts its business, including the count system. With that, I conclude my opening remarks and in a moment we'll turn to the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Conyers. Uh, in the meantime, I do want to advise members of the committee that I am going to have to step out to the uh, Republican Steering Committee and uh, the, the gentleman from uh, California, the chairman of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee who has done uh, uh, yeoman's work on this issue uh, will take the chair. Uh, and with that, I am pleased to, and I also want to welcome the gentleman from Maryland uh, for his work uh, in this uh, effort as well. So now we'll recognize the gentleman from Michigan for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Goodlatte. I uh, begin by welcoming the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform and its leaders to this joint hearing. I think it's very important and very appropriate. Today's hearings provide an opportunity to examine the telework program of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, a program that has recently come under scrutiny. And as we conduct this examination, there are several factors that should be considered. To begin with, telework programs, if implemented correctly, serve important purposes. They save taxpayer dollars, strengthen worker satisfaction and productivity, and help the environment through reduced traffic congestion. To its credit, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office has been at the forefront of developing and implementing this workplace innovation. And since January 2006, eligible patent examiners have been permitted to work from home. In fact, nearly Half of all patent examiners currently participate in the telework program. Considered one of the nation's leading government telework programs, it has played a critical role in enabling the Patent and Trademark Office to recruit and retain patent examiners with essential expertise. In fact, the Inspector General of the Department of Commerce issued a report in 2012 documenting the many successes of the Patent and Trademark Office's telework program. Specifically, the Inspector General found that program participants review more patent applications per year than their non-participating counterparts, which has helped, of course, to reduce the backlog of patent applications. The Inspector General also found that the program results in cost savings because of reduced need for office space, which saves American taxpayers about $20 million each year, according to the Patent and Trademark Office. This, in turn, allows the office to invest more resources in modernizing its information technology systems and offer better training for its patent examiners. Nevertheless, recent reports of abuse regarding time and attendance by patent examiners participating in this telework program must be taken seriously. It appears that some patent examiners 
We're paid for not working, which is a fraud against taxpayers. In addition, the Inspector General recently reported that the Patent and Trademark Office paid teleworking paralegals in the patent trial and appeals board for work they didn't even perform. Together, these reports raise serious concerns about the effectiveness of the office's management and workplace policies. To maintain the integrity of the telework program, the Patent and Trademark Office must verify the extent of the abuse and undertake immediate action to hold accountable those who committed the fraud. Doing so will send a clear signal that abuse of time and attendance will not be tolerated. I hope our witnesses discuss other ways to root out abuse and whether such abuse has impacted patent examination quality and patent application backlog. And finally, we must ensure that the Patent and Trademark Office has the tools to prevent further abuse. Following the reports of these problems to the Office of Inspector General, the office determined that it lacks sufficient controls to assess the extent of abuse. Such a lack of internal controls raises critical concerns. Fortunately, the office's investigators made several constructive regulations or recommendations regarding this problem. And uh, Mr. Chairman, that concludes uh, my statement. Uh, I yield back to balance my time and, wit and, and really warmly recognize uh, the witnesses uh, assembled here today for this hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Conyers. I now will recognize myself for a short opening statement. First of all, I'd like to thank Chairman Goodlett and all the members here today. It is unusual to have a joint hearing, but this hearing is, in fact, essential that it be joint. The jurisdiction of the Judiciary Committee over the sanctity of patents, the accuracy, and, in fact, the interest of this committee to end a backlog that denies inventors any benefit from their applications for longer and longer periods of time. And make no doubt about it, a 600,000-plus patent backlog is costing the American economy and entrepreneurs far greater than the fees that have been paid by these companies and individuals that are, in fact, in some cases, being misspent by individuals who do not do their full job. The Patent and Trademark Office does have a responsibility to foster innovation, enabling entrepreneurs and inspiring Americans to enjoy, and non-Americans, to enjoy the so-called American dream. I'm proud to have worked with this agency both as an applicant and as a member of Congress. On the screen, I've asked to have my historic work, some of the many patents uh, that I was granted during my time in, in private life. Whether it's my patents, my trademarks, or even my copyrights, I understand that it's a handshake arrangement with the government. We pay for the application. We pay the salaries of every employee at the PTO because, in fact, we pay all of the cost of the PTO. And in some cases, historically, even money is siphoned off from those fees to, to the general revenue. And this committee has done yeoman's work to stop that. But the fact is, the applica applicant is paying for a service, and if that service is delayed under uh, modern patent law, every day an applicant is denied their claim is a day they cannot enforce their patent. PTO employee telework program has been highly regarded and often touted as a model of telework programs across the federal government. Recent revelations make it clear it should not have been touted. It is recognized that among other problems, managers have been denied the ability to verify whether the federal worker is doing their job at all. Make no doubt about it, that cannot continue. It was after receiving anonymous whistleblower complaints regarding employee abuse of the telework program at the PTO that the Inspector General, present here today, referred these allegations to the PTO for internal review and requested 
the PTO supply results to the IG. That is one of our challenges. And I <coughs> is that, in fact, the IG did not, in the ordinary course, do the, uh, uh, the audit. I would like at this time to ask unanimous consent that both the long version, the 32 pages, and the short version, the 16-page reports, be placed in the record. Without objection, so ordered. When the IG, when the report came back to the IG, it contrasted with the two uh, uh, reports I just mentioned, a long report that outlined serious flaws in the process, including, as I said, managers saying they did not have the tools 43 or 44 percent of the time to uh, evaluate whether or not the work was being done. Sadly, in the 16-page filtered report, the, 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 uh, this was pared down to where it said some said they did, some said they didn't. That is not acceptable. We all understand that if nearly half of all managers say they don't have the tools, then in fact the tools are certainly not available to them. The leaked internal 32-page report suggests that problems at the PTO may have been far deeper and, at least to this member, may have been sanitized in the 16-page report. The 32-page report included stronger guidance to correct the abuses. Unfortunately, many of these recommendations were watered down or filtered out of the report provided to the Office of Inspector General. Not only is this problematic for the purpose of good governance, but it is an abuse that it jeopardizes the quality of PTO work and, in fact, que makes us question whether or not any agency ever can, in fact, be assigned internal review by an Inspector General again. Time and attendance records must be carefully monitored at the time when 600,000 applicants are still backlogged and the number of patent applications increased by 5 percent each year. The success of our inventors and the economy demands no less. Practices by the PTO employees with names like enloading and mortgaging are scams against free pay, uh, fee paying applicants and do nothing to benefit the quality of the examiner's work. And uh, the 32-page internal report found that managers interviewed 77 percent felt they have one or more employees who engage in end loading, which is waiting to the last minute to complete work on their quotas. Later we will see graphs of spikes that show a dramatic increase at the end uh, of, the of the time. As, in fact, a historic fee-paying applicant, I can tell you one thing. Some of that is waiting to the end and dusting off final work, and I can accept some of that. But clearly, there is an irresistible incentive at the end of a quarter to get something off your desk. That often means that what you get is a rejection with a vague statement that you have to overcome. Their rejection takes only a few moments, but it can cost you thousands or tens of thousands of dollars to simply say you didn't get it right, you didn't look at the detail, you were simply trying to get it off your desk. These and other abuses by this committee cannot be tolerated, and the inability of managers to know whether or not the workers are actually performing the work cannot be tolerated by the Committee on Oversight. So together, I am thrilled to hear from our witnesses today, and I now uh, take the pleasure to yield to my co-partner in this, the gentleman from uh, Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I was, uh, first of all, I'm uh, pleased that you and Mr. Goodlatte and certainly Ms. Conyers have called this uh, hearing today. Uh, unfortunately, we found out that we could not have uh, uh, one of our experts uh, in the Congress, Mr. Connolly, to be a part of the panel without giving up one of our minority witnesses. So therefore, I am going to yield my time to him. He has worked very, very hard on this issue. Spent his blood, sweat, and tears, and so therefore I yield my time to him. I thank my friend from Maryland, and I thank him for his graciousness. Today's hearing examines the United States Patent and Trademark Office, which Congress has entrusted with the critical mission of turning the words of the copyright clause of the United States Constitution into a living reality for thousands of American inventors and entrepreneurs. PTO is a unique user fee supported agency 
that relies on zero taxpayer dollars to fund operations, minimizes federal real property and utility costs, and is fundamentally performance-based in that the organization strives to use real quantitative outcome metrics to measure productivity and incentivize better performance from its patent professionals. PTO has long prided itself on being a result-driven agency that holds its patent examiners to strict quota requirements. Indeed, it does have much to be proud of, particularly its performance in fiscal year 2014, when it is anticipated that PTO's core of 8,500 patent professionals will act on more than 600,000 patent applications and issue more than 300,000 new uh, patents. As one of our witnesses will testify today, 2014 is likely to be PTO's most productive year in its 224-year history. However, that's not why we convene today's hearing. We're here to examine a cloud that threatens to overshadow and undermine much of the positive work cited above. The irresponsible abuse of user fees by a certain subset of examiners who in the process of commuting time car, uh, committing time card fraud, being unresponsive to patent applicants, and submitting incomplete work not only waste applicant dollars, but dishonor and insult the vast majority of dedicated and hardworking PTO employees. Let me be crystal clear. The isolated, though outrageous, anecdotal reports of abuse transcend partisanship and concern every member of this dais. Significantly, the most outrage and anger I've personally encountered toward the time of attendance abuse has been lev levied by PTO workers themselves, who greatly resent working long hours to meet stringent performance standards only to have their own collective reputations dragged through the mud by a small minority of cheaters and bad apples. It's incumbent upon all of us on behalf of PTO's critical constitutional mandate and the thousands of hardworking civil servants who are working hard and playing by the rules every day, that we work with PTO to ensure it has effective systems in place to root out and hold accountable those few examiners who would threaten the reputation of everyone. It's also important that we not oversimplify matters or do more harm than good by overreacting to isolated incidents with bureaucratic one-size-fits-all solutions. For the reality is that the major challenges facing PTO are neither simple nor easy to overcome. My hope is today's hearing will move beyond addressing symptoms related to telework to focus on the fundamental PTO problems related to insufficient performance metrics that may be subject to gaming and managers who are stuck in an antiquated, if I can't see you, you must not be working. The bottom line is that it is striking how the most concerning aspects of this hearing, issues related to balancing the need for quality and quantity, and questions over whether the correct incentives are being set, have actually little to do with telework per se. These are issues that would face the agency, and indeed have faced the agency, whether all of its workers were seated in cubicles or working from home or rem remote locations. It's important to remember the PTO instituted its telework program to empower the agency to enhance its workforce capabilities without incurring additional costs in the form of real property expenses and high attrition. Based on the program's specific goal, PTO's pioneering telework actually has been successful. As Commissioner Focarino will testify, uh, since 2005, PTO has been able to double the number of patent examiners to total approximately 8,300 today without incurring additional property costs, while lowering attrition from 9.07% to 3.4% this year. In addition, PTO's continuity of operations operations have been improved. For example, during the March uh, 2013 snowstorm that shut down the entire federal government, PTO's patent examiners maintained an 83% production rate. Very impressive. I hope today's hearing is not the opening of an effort to curtail the productivity tools that were enacted by the Telework Enhancement Act of 2010, which I was help, proud to help write alongside Mr. Sarbanes and my friend and colleague, Mr. Wolf from Virginia. I want to thank the witnesses for being here today and thank our chairman and ranking members for holding the hearing. 
And Mr. Chairman, finally, I would ask unanimous consent that a letter addressed to the four of you from the Association of Commuter Transportation be entered into the record. Without objection and delight, so ordered. I thank the Chair. I thank my colleague and friend from Maryland for being so gracious. Does the ranking member have anything else? No. Thank you. All members may have five days in which to submit uh, written statements for the record. With that, we go to our first panel of witnesses. Pursuant to uh, the normal rules, uh, Mr. Wolf will not be sworn. Uh, however, I would ask all other witnesses to please rise to take the oath. Raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Please be seated. Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Our first witness this morning will be the Honorable Frank Wolf. He is a member of Congress and has been for many, many years. He is in his 17th term. He is a senior member of the Virginia delegation and serves as chairman of the Commerce, Justice, uh, Science and Related Agency Subcommittee on the Appropriation Committee. He also serves on the Transportation, Housing and Urban Development Committee. Prior to being elected, Congressman Wolf was in the, is, to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1981. Congressman Wolf served in the United States Army as a reservist and later became an attorney for the military. He earned his, his J.D. from Georgetown University Law Center and his undergraduate degree in political science from Pennsylvania State University. It is, in fact, a great pleasure to have a long-serving and distinguished member of his stand, standing, and I would ask that, uh, as I understand, you're not going to take questions, but that you uh, give your testimony, and then we'll go on. <clears throat> the gentleman is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank the committee members for allowing me to testify today. I ha am pleased to say I am a huge advocate of telework. Time and again, I have said there is nothing magic about strapping yourself into a metal box and driving 40 or 50 miles a day. If you have a job that is conducive to teleworking, then you should be given the opportunity to telework. Many members of my staff regularly telework. Studies show that telework increases worker productivity, reduces traffic, and helps the environment, and it's also a quality of life issue. But the series of articles in the Washington Post over the last several months detailing problems with the Patent and Trademark Office telework programs are very, very alarming. Secretary Pritzker is well aware of my displeasure. She and I have talked on the phone about the issue, and I have also written in a communication with her. I want to enter the record of my August 11, 2014 letter to, to her. It clearly states my unhappiness with PTO and ends with this sentence, quote, I encourage you to take immediate action to hold these fraudulent employees accountable and send a clear message that this abuse will no longer be tolerated, end of quote. I also want to submit to the hearing record my September 15, 2014 letter to the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia, urging him to open a criminal investigation into possible fraudulent activities to PTO with regard to time and attendance. To say that I'm extremely disappointed that PTO failed to manage its telework program and in general to provide adequate managerial oversight throughout the organization would be an understatement. Compounding this are attempts, I believe, to minimize the problem. While I am confident that the vast majority of people working at PTO are honest, hardworking federal employees, there are some, unfortunately, who are abusing the telework program. They should be fired, and in all honesty, they should have been already dismissed. I firmly believe that PTO and the Commerce Department fails to terminate employees who abuse the system, other telework programs to cost the federal government could very well be in jeopardy. It is imperative that PTO identify any misconduct and management lapses and work to put in place systems to ensure that it does not happen in the future. I understand that some mid-level managers at a PTO feel like their hands are tied, but there are certain things that can be done and must be done to ensure that staff are actually working their 80 hours of pay period. I also understand the PTO has the capability to know if their employees are in the building or are working on their computers, but these tools are not used. I would also like to point out that these abuses weren't just perpetrated by telework employees, but that other employees report every day to the PTO headquarters building in Alexandria 
have also been gaming time and attendance through the system. I understand that PTO has brought the National Academy of Public Administration to review its telework program. This is a very, very positive first step. But I would urge the committee to re ask that the NAPA report not only to the PTO, but also to the committees. You need to make sure that the recommendations are, are carry, carried out. NAPA, as you know, was chartered by Congress to assist federal, state, and local governments in improving their effectiveness, efficiency, and accountability. I have enlisted NAPA on multiple occasions during my tenure as chairman of the Commerce, Justice, Science, and Appropriations Committee. NAPA played a major, huge role in the transformation of the FBI following the 9-11 attacks. But the difference there is Director Mueller really wanted NAPA to be involved. He was encouraging NAPA, and he pretty much said, we're going to do what NAPA tells us to. I've asked NAPA to work with the Department of Commerce to study the effects of offshoring the U.S. workforce. In 2013, NAPA worked with NASA to review its security practices, some Chinese espionage and things like this, and NASA was really not excited about it. And so they're not sure they're really going to carry it out. So I would think the committees ought to get the report from NAPA to make sure that NAPA recommendations are followed. NAPA does good work. It is independent and it is nonpartisan. It would bring fresh eyes, a fresh set of eyes to the problem and provide a thorough review of PTO's telework programs and make recommendations to return it to the model program, and it was a model that it once was. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to testify. Uh, this is an important issue, and Congress has a clear role with regard to the oversight. Moreover, I think telework has an important role to play in improving morale, improving productivity, cutting rents and office overhead costs, and alleviating traffic congestion, and allowing individuals to spend more time with their families, but only if those who participate in these programs follow appropriate and effective management guidelines. And I thank both subcommittees for having uh, the hearing. I thank the gentleman. And I, all of the uh, references you made will be included in the, re in the record without objection. And I'd like to take a short point of personal privilege. And Congressman Wolf, Frank, thank you for your many years of service. This may be the last time you testify before this committee as a current member. Uh, but I suspect we will hear from you in your retirement as you continue to be so dedicated. So thank you for your extra effort here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you. you. Our second witness today is the Honorable Margaret Facchino. She is the Commissioner of Patents and, uh, at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. She was appointed in January 2012 to her present position but she is, in fact, not new to the PTO. She, is <clears throat> she has been the chief operating officer, and she has been responsible for the administration of the patent operation and examining policy. She began her career, though, with the PTO in 1977 as a patent examiner. She, has, she was later promoted to senior executive service and served as the deputy commissioner for patents for, for a time. She earned her certificate in advanced public management at Syracuse University and, her, uh, and earned her undergraduate degree in physics at State University of New York. Thank you and welcome. Our third witness is the Honorable Todd Zinzer. Uh, he is Inspector General of the United States Department of Commerce. In his position, Mr. Zinzer uh, leads the team of auditors, investigators, attorneys, and support staff responsible for improving the Department's business, scientific, and economic programs and operations. Prior to being sworn in as the fifth Inspector General in December of 2007, he served 24 years as a career civil servant in the U.S. Department of Labor and the United States Department of Transportation. He holds his master's degree from Miami University and his bachelor's degree from Northern Kentucky University. Additionally, he complete, competed, uh, completed the Senior Managers in Government Program at Harvard University's Kennedy Center for Government. Our next witness is Mr. Robert Bodens. Mr. Bodens is president of the Patent Office Professional Association. In his position, Mr. Bowden represents and protects the interest of more than 8,000 patent examiners 
and other patent professionals at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. In addition, he serves on the PTO's Patent Public Advisory Committee. Prior to joining the association as president in 2006, Mr. Bowden served at the PTO as a Ph.D. level biotechnology examiner who specialized in immunologic methods of detecting and treating HIV and AIDS. That's really technical patent examining. Mr. Bowden earned his MS in immunology from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center and is his BS and MS in microbiology from Brigham Young University. Wow. Ms. Esther Keplinger, our fifth witness, is chief patent counselor for Windsor, Somali, Goodrich, and Rosati. In her per current position, she serves as the firm's liaison to the Patent and Trademark Office in order to ensure the patents are filed efficiently and enhance the firm's inter-parties PTO practice. Prior to joining the firm in 2009, she served as Deputy Commissioner of Patent Operations at the PTO for a full five years. As Deputy Commissioner, she oversaw the patent examining, examination process with the nation's patent examiners reporting to her. Ms. Uh, Keplinger uh, pursued her graduate studies in biochemistry and earned her B.S. in bio biology from Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Okay. Uh, and she will testify today in her capacity as vice chair of the Patent Public Advisory Committee. Our last witness today, Mr. William Smith. Mr. Smith uh, is of counsel at Baker Hostetler. In his position, Mr. Smith advises clients on issues regarding prosecutions and appeals in patent applications, reissues, and reexamination procedures. Prior to entering private practice in September of 2007, Mr. Smith served 31 years at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office making permanent, uh, uh, sorry, patent determinations. He, he also served as an administrative patent judge at the Patent Trial and Appeals Board for a full 19 years. He earned his JD from the University of Baltimore School of Law and his engineering degree from Georgia Institute of Technology. Mr. Smith will testify today in his individual capacity. I would ask each witness to summarize your testimony. As you saw, we'll try to stay as close as we can to five minutes. Uh, if you'll do that, we guarantee your entire written statements be placed in the rep record. Uh, ladies first, Ms. Ricard. Well, thank you. Chairman Issa and members of the committees, Thank you for this opportunity to appear before you to discuss the United States Patent and Trademark Office's telework program and recent press reports regarding its operation and management. We take these reports very seriously, and that is why I want to share with you today how our program works, why it plays a critical part in our agency's role in advancing innovation, and what we are doing to continue to improve our program. I'd first like to acknowledge Chairman Wolf's leadership on telework issues and thank him for his support of the many improvements we've made to our operations in recent years. He has raised his strong concerns about abuse in our telework program, which we are doing our best to address, including hiring an independent consultant, the National Academy of Public Administration, to evaluate our telework programs and to advise us on further improvements. I'd also like to acknowledge the work of the Department of Commerce Inspector General. We have worked closely with the IG staff on a number of issues and continue to discuss and consider their recommendations. Our telework program has been a critical part of improving our patent operations in recent years. No program is perfect, and the USPTO's telework program is no exception. Our own investigation into whistleblower allegations of time and attendance abuse, as covered in recent press reports, helped shine a light on areas where our telework program needed to be improved. Our investigation identified isolated abuse. 
Following the investigation, we took immediate disciplinary action. We also immediately took other actions to improve our program. In July of 2013, submitted a report to the OIG with eight recommendations. We've addressed these recommendations and taken additional steps to strengthen the oversight and management of USPTO's patent telework program. Since 2012, we developed new, more effective guidance on our patents telework program, ensured that these policies were accessible, and then conducted extensive training sessions to make sure that our supervisors understand and follow the policies so that better controls are in place to help account for hours worked. We now require the use of electronic collaboration tools for full-time teleworkers to improve the accessibility and interaction between teleworking employees, their supervisors, and their on-campus colleagues. And we have standardized the process for accessing relevant electronic records to be used when investigating alleged violations. We are clarifying what steps supervisors should take if they suspect any misconduct, and we're ensuring that we proceed appropriately and consistently in those situations. All of these actions help ensure our programs are effective, that employees are accessible and responsive, and that expectations for both supervisors and employees are clearly communicated and understood. Further, to ensure that we have the best tools and procedures in place, USPTO has also established two cross-agency teams to explore additional ways to prevent abuse and intervene early, and to review the entire conduct process, including co consistent, effective enforcement of policies. USPTO's core mission is to deliver high quality and timely examination of patent and trademark applications. To effectively manage our increasing workload while maintaining high quality standards in a constantly evolving technological and legal environment, we have grown and invested in our workforce to enable them to perform their mission to the best of their ability. Our telework program has increased the USPTO's ability to recruit and retain highly skilled employees with technical backgrounds throughout the country while producing substantial operational cost savings. It has allowed us to more than double the number of patent examiners since 2005 without significantly increasing our real estate footprint. Following the press coverage this summer, our management team conducted briefings for your committee staffs on the USPTO's telework program, on the report submitted to the Department of Commerce Inspector General in July of 2013, and on the improvements already implemented. We continue to implement management changes addressing time and attendance, including through engagement with our unions. Chairman Issa, we understand that some serious issues were raised in recent press reports. Please be assured that we are taking many necessary steps to strengthen and improve management controls around our telework program so that it serves our innovators and remains one that is aspired to by all other federal agencies. Thank you. Mr. Zinser. Chairman Goodlett, Chairman Issa, Ranking Members Conyers and Cummings, we appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Earlier this year, internal PTO reports, which were published in the Washington Post in an investigative report issued publicly by my office concerning waste and mismanagement at the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, have raised serious questions about PTO's management of its workforce, in particular whether time and telework abuse have become a systemic problem at PTO. A number of factors place PTO at significant risk for time and telework abuse. These include PTO's increased flexi time policy, the very large percentage of employees participating full time in telework programs, limitations placed by PTO senior management on the use of tools and data when time or telework abuse is suspected, and what is at least perceived to be a culture that has developed over time that has de emphasized time and attendance rules in favor of patent examiner production results. The 32-page report produced by PTO investigators contained very candid quotes from more than 75 interviews with supervisors and managers about these risk factors 
some of which I will repeat here. We are currently looking into several time and attendance matters and auditing PTO's quality assurance program, including our review of end loading and patent mortgaging. End loading occurs when patent examiners submit large amounts of their work at the end of the quarter rather than consistently throughout the quarter. Supervisors describe the end loading problem in the following manner, quote, some make you question whether the excessive end loaders were actually working, end quote. Another stated, quote, on its face, it raises the question about how good it can be if it all was done at the end, end quote. Patent mortgaging occurs when examiners deliberately submit incomplete work to get automatic credit necessary to meet their production goals. Unlike end loading, PTO considers patent mortgaging to be misconduct. But some supervisors believe that PTO overlooks conduct issues as long as an examiner's performance is acceptable. One supervisor summed it up this way, quote, they overlook conduct issues, they don't care anymore, the only focus is that we are the number one agency with happy employees, end quote. While this may not reflect the views of all supervisors, both end loading and mortgaging do raise questions about how examiners are actually using their time. The risk created by the increased flexibilities in PTO's work schedules and alternative work locations were reflected by supervisors in the following comment. Quote, there is quite a bit of flexibility for the examiners. The office should continue to work with POPA to allow supervisory patent examiners the tools to account for time and attendance and work performance, end quote. Based on our work and our review of the internal PTO reports, I would offer the following observations. First, based on the evidence we have seen so far, I do not think the time and telework abuse at PTO has yet reached the systemic level. But the only reason that is not the case is because I am confident that the vast majority of PTO employees are honest. It is nonetheless a serious problem. The findings of our work and PTO's internal investigations indicate that it would be extremely easy compared to other federal workplaces for large numbers of the PTO workforce to cheat on their time if they wanted to do so. Second, PTO has been taking some corrective steps since learning of allegations of systemic time and telework abuse, but it needs to do more. PTO should go back and adopt the 15 specific recommendations made in the initial 32-page report. In addition, supervisors and employee relations staff should be able to readily access, access any available data when necessary to resolve questions about an employee's time and attendance and work production. Finally, PTO senior leaders need to ensure they do not minimize the problem. <clears throat> The first thing that should be done is that PTO senior leadership should recognize and reward the members of the investigative team responsible for documenting the problems and issuing the 32-page report. Those employees who called our hotline about this problem are certainly whistleblowers, but so are the PTO team members who investigated and candidly reported their results to management. I would ask the senior leadership of PTO to protect them in their careers for their courage in issuing their report. Chairman Goodlad and ISA, this concludes my statement. I look forward to answering any questions the committee may have. Thank you, Mr. Budin. Chairman Goodlad, Chairman ISA, Ranking Member Conyers, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committees. POPA represents more than 8,500 patent professionals at the USPTO, including more than 8,300 patent examiners who determine patentability. The Washington Post has published articles alleging widespread time and attendance abuse among teleworking examiners. One article discussed a 32-page draft report that differed significantly from a final agency report submitted to the Inspector General. The article alleged that information had been filtered out to hide the worst telework abuses. Another article alleged the draft report found that thousands of telecommuting and patent examiners had lied about their hours, language that is just not there. Many assumed that the draft report was some sort of gospel fact rather than what it was, a collection of anecdotes and unsubstantiated allegations. That is why the draft was never sent to the IG in the first place and does not bear the signature of Fred Steckler, the USPTO's chief administrative officer. Agency culture already ensures that any non-working examiner will face disciplinary action. The agency has a performance appraisal plan that tightly controls examiner performance. Examiner performance is tracked and reported every two weeks. 
Both quarterly and yearly re performance is reported and used as the basis of disciplinary action. Production is measured in six minute inter intervals using a page full of statistics. Quality is measured over 19 different examination duties. Docket management requires examiners to clean, complete work within prescribed time periods. This is so complex that it requires com computerized calculators now to enable examiners to track performance. Stakeholder interaction requires examiners to provide courteous and professional service as well as advice on searching and prosecuting prosecution issues to the public and their peers. Examiner actions are also reviewed by both the inventor and his or her attorney who have a vested interest in pointing out examiner errors. Anyone who understands patent examining and the many tools the agency has for tracking examiner activities knows that it would be impossible for the agency to have its most productive year ever, yet have thousands of examiners getting paid for not working. There is no systemic plague of poorly performing employees at the USPTO. Any organization of 12,000 plus employees will have a handful of employees who run into difficulties in the workplace. When it becomes necessary, history shows that the agency is capable of taking action to deal with employee behavior. In August 2005, the National Academy of Public Administration issued a major study of the issues facing the USPTO. The NAPA report showed that the agency removed 18 examiners in a year when only 210 employees were removed from federal service across all non-defense federal agencies. That's almost 10 percent. Before the Post articles, the agency and POPA had already resolved some issues raised in the reports. When a few examiners had managed to receive performance bonuses while having overdue cases, we agreed to modify the Dock and Management Award criteria to prevent this situation. When it became apparent that the number of office actions returned for correction could skew an examiner's docket management performance, we agreed to further modify the element and award criteria to prevent this from happening. Pope, <coughs> excuse me, Pope is concerned by the misinformation regarding work credit abuse or mortgaging by examiners. It has been alleged that examiners can intentionally submit incomplete work for credit and use that credit for making production and awards. This is just plain wrong. All the authors already know that mortgaging has never been acceptable behavior condoned by either the USPTO or POPA. The best that can be said is that they are confusing mistakes for intentional lack of effort. It is well recognized practice that actions containing mistakes that are corrected in a timely fashion count as legitimately completed work. Implementing disruptive procedures to ensure that an examiner is working the full 80 hours per pay period is counterproductive. Patent examining is mentally demanding work. Much time is spent in activities that do not require being parked in front of a computer, such as reading and becoming familiar with patent applications, reading prior art references, reading applicant responses and appeal briefs, and answering phone calls. Every time the examiner is interrupted by some tracking procedure, it represents a loss in productivity. Instead of focusing on examination, they have to focus on ensuring that their supervisors are aware that they are working. The best way to ensure that employees are working is to have a good objective set of performance goals and then determine if employees meet them. Examiners are paid to accomplish performance goals, not to keep an office chair warm and a light flashing on a supervisor's computer screen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Kaplinger. Good afternoon, Chairman Issa, Ranking Members Conyers and Cummings, members of the committees. It's my great pleasure to be here today on behalf of the USPTO Patent Public Advisory Committee, PPAC, about allegations of misconduct in the patents telework programs. As intended by Congress, much of the role of the PPAC is to focus on operational issues of patents. We review very large amounts of generated operational data to identify areas that we think are not working well. And in the areas of quality and pendency, we believe we've made valuable contributions. The past five to 10 years have brought incredible changes in the IP arena, including significant legislative changes, many Supreme Court decisions, and within the USPTO, a doubling of the patent examining core and development of the telework programs. With these changes come significant operational and management challenges. The anonymous complaints to the IG were directed primarily to the abuse in the patent telework programs. 
I have several comments. We believe that this is not a telework issue per se, but rather a broader management issue that should be addressed regarding the entire patent examining core. The identified misconduct are, uh, is not related to whether or not the individual examiner works on campus or remotely. Unfortunately, instances of TNA abuse, end loading, and mortgaging all existed prior to the implementation of the telework programs. Occurrences of TNA misconduct and mortgaging have been and continue to be identified through data analysis and we believe are being addressed by the management of the USPTO. The USPTO should identify additional means of monitoring potential abuse, including whether additional reporting by patent examiners is necessary for effective management of the overtime program. We believe the USPTO is taking these allegations seriously and has already implemented a number of changes to address the concerns of abuse. It is highly improbable that systemic and widespread abuse of TNAs exist at the USPTO when one considers the available objective criteria demonstrating their performance. The backlog of new applications and RCEs has been decreasing, pendency of the applications continues to decline, and the customer surveys indicate that the quality of the work is increasing. The existing measures in place consistently show improvement in the performance and output by patent examiners, undercutting any contention of the existence of widespread abuse. A concern for the PPAC regarding these allegations is the potential impact on the quality of the work. If an examiner waits until the end of the rating periods to complete a very large portion of the work, the quality of that work may suffer. USPTO utilizes a variety of tools to measure and improve quality and according to internal measurements, customer feedback, the quality continues to improve. Therefore, it appears that current tools, along with the new steps being taken by the USPTO, are and will be effective for monitoring and controlling quality. The USPTO must remain vigilant on quality, however, and evaluate whether any additional changes are needed. While the USPTO did take actions against some examiners, some managers seem to think that the actions are not always taken. This perception is quite serious. Recently, training has been provided to employees and supervisors about the policies, but they should evaluate whether more is needed, particularly to managers, regarding when and how to consider taking employee actions for potential abuse. The PPAC had considered the allegations of abuse, had conversations with upper management about the issues, and are confident that these issues are being addressed. In the 2014 annual report, the PPAC strongly recommended that systems be put into place to properly manage the telework programs to measure productivity and monitor potential abuse. We do not believe the USPTO management would look the other way in the face of evidence of abuse because in our experience, the USPTO consistently has been working to make improvements in the operations of patents and in fact has taken actions against abusers. In summary, the PPAC shares the committee's concerns regarding these recent allegations of instances of abuse in the USPTO's telework and other programs. Although it seems that the alleged, any alleged abuses are not systemic, no abuse should be tolerated. The PTO believes this issue is a key priority and intends to continue monitoring it and will work with the USPTO and union representatives to identify possible changes to programs to curb abuses in the future. On behalf of myself and the whole Patent Advisory Committee, we would like to express our appreciation for the opportunity to address this issue. Thank you. Thank you. And as I recognize, Mr. Smith, uh, your, your firm is in Seattle, your home is in California, and you came from Japan to yep. address us. And I, I want to thank you very much for the, uh, your world traveling necessary to be before this committee. Well, if, if I may, just for a second, I, I did get home at midnight. I live in Arizona Sunday, and I left for the airport for here at 11 a.m. I did have time to say hello and goodbye to my wife and get a new suitcase. But I, I appreciate the invitation, and Chairman Issa, ranking, mem uh, ranking members and members of the committees. Mr. Smith, if you continue that, you'll probably end up in Congress with that travel schedule. Okay. <laughs> Gentlemen my recognized. My testimony is from the perspective of one who has spent 42 years working in the wonderful United States patent system. My first career was spent at the PTO, where I worked for over 33 years, ending after serving over 19 years as an administrative patent judge. 
As a PTO employee, I, I participated in all the alternative work schedule programs the agency created over my years of service, and I appreciate PTO management for, for being so progressive. During my last year of service as an administrative patent judge, we moved to South Carolina, and I became one of the agency's first remote teleworkers, uh, commuting back uh, from South Carolina to the office for my required 16 hours per week. Since my transition to the private se sector in December of 2005, each firm I have worked for has extended me the privilege of being a teleworker. I was not surprised when the current allegations of patent examiner time and attendance abuse were raised as these issues have long been present at the PTO. Throughout my years at the PTO, those patent examiners who wanted to game the system could easily do so, especially those who were high, high producers of patent examiner counts. My 19 years as an administrative patent judge required me to review the written work product of patent examiners in thousands of appeals. My current role in patent prosecution also allows me the opportunity to review the written work product of patent examiners. This experience has shown me that it is relatively simple for a patent examiner to draft an office action that is superficially plausible, yet lacks credibility under scrutiny. Thus, those patent examiners that want to abuse the system can fly under the radar without significant risk of detection as long as they are perceived as being productive. The patent examination process should be a continuous collegial conversation between a patent examiner and applicant to find patentable subject matter in a patent application and claim that subject matter in a clear manner. Unfortunately, the historic compact prosecution system with its outdated final rejection practice does not allow for such a conversation. The hallmark of the present compact prosecution system is that the second action in each case is normally made final. That, that final rejection artificially halts all momentum in the case and forces the conversation to resume in a request for con continued examination filed by an applicant which can take months or years for the patent examiner to take up for action. As discussed in my submitted testimony, I have a number of suggestions. First, the patent examiner's productivity metrics must be changed so that a patent examiner is incentivized and rewarded for efficiently and effectively examining a patent application to its ultimate allowance or abandonment, not just to reach a final rejection that artificially halts that process. Second, as to how the patent examiners account for their examining time. I believe that to the extent patent examiners are not currently required to do so, their time accounting software should be set up so that patent examiners' daily time is accounted for in terms of the patent application reviewed and the specific core exam act activities performed, such as analyzing patent application disclosures and claims, searching, drafting office actions. Such a system will allow PTO management to see how a patent examiner is actually spending their submitted examining time on a daily basis. This will allow for corrective action or additional training if a patent examiner is seen to be inefficient in one or more of their core examination activities. Third, in terms of the present telework program, I urge that it be maintained but improved. If the above suggested reforms to the management systems in place, are instituted, the patent examination process will be more efficient, and those patent examiners who want to game the system will have less opportunity to do so. I suggest the PTO teleworker program should be changed by having patent examiners who newly enter the program to be within commuting distance of the Alexandria campus or one of the four new regional offices so they can be available to management their colleagues and applicants as needed for training, mentoring, and most importantly, in-person interviews with applicants that history shows significantly uh, improve the quality and uh, lessen dependency of patent applications. Finally, I believe that the most good that can come out of the present situation is for the PTO and POPA to agree that all of these systems need to be changed, commit to do so in an expeditious manner, such efforts must include the particip participation and input of stakeholders so that all parties in the patent examination process can work to bring the patent examination systems into the 21st century. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, anecdotally, I'll, I'll mention that uh, 
I have seen those rejections. I have seen the well thought out rejections to claims, and I have seen the end of the quarter rejections. Uh, and uh, sadly, it's those end of the quarter ones cost just as much to overcome uh, as the ones that are meritorious. Uh, some might say, though, of my 37 patents, some of them perhaps they just closed them out as approved and didn't look carefully enough. We'll probably never know if they're not challenged. Uh, Mr. Zinsler, uh, the August 10, 2014, Washington Post story detailing the differences between the 32 page internal report and the 16 page report to your office. You were quoted as saying that you had hoped to see from PTO was an unfiltered response and that such a response was not what was provided to your office. That is an accurate quote, isn't it? Yes, sir. And because you delegated uh, this investigation, if you will, this audit, weren't you entitled to an unfiltered set of information since they were doing work on your behalf and not asked to reach only conclusions? I would say yes, sir. And I, I think if the management wanted to include a management statement on top of the report, which often happens with our own audits, that would have been perfectly acceptable. But when you were denied work product, it, it created a lot of questions. And the Washington Post asked those. And uh, Ms. Fercarino, let me just uh, ask you a couple of questions. On August 10th, in that same report, uh, the CAO, uh, 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 Steckler, who authored both memos, uh, and as Mr. Bowden said, one was unsigned, uh, was quoted as saying that the changes between the two memos were because the conclusions were partial and unsupported. You recognize that term? Well, I would like to know, for the record, when in fact the, the long report said 44 percent of the SPE said they did not have the tools they needed to address TNA abuse, time and attendance. Now, that is obviously not unsupported, is it? That is a percentage. Was that percentage accurate based on 75 interviews? So it wasn't partial, it wasn't unsupported, and the 16-page report, if I paraphrase it right, said, well, some said they did and some said they didn't. Do you believe that if you had 44 percent saying that they did not have the tools, that that was something that should have been deleted from the IG report and ultimately from the public? I want to reiterate that we take those allegations very seriously. Yeah, but you watered them down. They, they, they were omitted. Let me go through a couple more quickly. Additionally, partial or, and uns, or unsupported, 38 percent said the agency was willing to overlook conduct issue if performance was acceptable. Now, I, I think I heard even in the IG's statement that the word some, 38 percent is a heck of a lot. It is not just some. Isn't that true? Yes, Wouldn't 38 percent more than a third said that the agency had this kind of a, uh, a flaw be wor worthy of corrective action? Mr. Yes, sir. Additionally, 36 percent of directors said that they had requested employee records uh, on partial time and attendance, a potential time and attendance abuse, and had been denied. Now, if your managers cannot get the records to show whether somebody is cheating or not, then how can Mr. Booten even tell me that it is a small amount? The fact is you are not counting. Isn't that correct? You don't know what you don't know. Isn't that true? Well, records are available. Well, but if they are being denied them, and 36 percent of the directors said they were denied them, why were they denied them? Were they denied them because the union contract shields from that kind of checking up after the fact? Sir, I want to reiterate that all of the interview summaries, there were 81 interview summaries with comments that those statistics were derived from, and all of that information was provided in the final report, every one of the 81 interviews. Mr. Zinsler, 36 percent said they were denied. Was that in the final 16-page report? It was not in the report, sir. The, the results of the interviews themselves were pretty much, for the most part, um, uh, removed from the, the report that was so sent to our office. The old term, you didn't have the cross tabs to, uh, to in fact, know how deep these problems were. 44 percent said they didn't have the tools. 38 percent said you, your agency was willing to overlook the time and attendance and other things as long as they hit performance numbers, uh, which Mr. Smith said can be artificially given. And 36 percent of the directors said they were denied requests. Mr. Budin, I'm interested in your statement. I believe I heard you more or less say that it was okay not to work 80 hours as long as you hit the numbers. 
Well, let me ask you a very simple question as the union rep. If this agency is not able to verify whether people are actually working or not, you say as long as they hit the numbers, how do the American people and the applicants get a fair question when many of these examiners are applying for overtime without any proof? If they are asking for overtime, do we do that based on attendance? Is this piecework and we, we grant overtime based on excess? The fact is these individuals are paid by the hour. The report said, as I understand it correctly, that, uh, that people asked for overtime, said they earned overtime and didn't have to prove it and couldn't be double checked. Isn't that true? Please, yes or no. There, you, first of all, I've never said that people shouldn't be working, you know, and, and they get paid for 80 hours. Well, I asked you, the what real I'm question, the is, question I asked you was, in fact, if, if in fact the union is protecting p from the, getting the records to know whether someone's working or not, that means people who apply for overtime, in fact, we can't justify whether or not they made it. Mr. Zinsley, you've looked at both reports. Do we have a way to credibly understand whether or not somebody worked more than 80 hours and whether that was justified based on uh, your investigation of the long report? There are ways to find out. PTO was not uh, availing themselves of those methods. Okay. So tools were not used. Mr. Smith, uh, Ms. Kimlier, if you have anything to add quickly, I, I left you out and I apologize. No. Mr. Smith. In, in, in terms of my experience, especially now in reviewing the patent examiner's work product and advising uh, patent applicants uh, how to respond, uh, I would say overall patent examiners, I give them an A for earnestness, wanting to do the right thing. But in too many cases, the written work product is, is difficult to respond to. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Conyers. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> Uh, and I want to thank the witnesses uh, for their variety of testimony. Uh, <clears throat> President Budens, let me ask you about the uh, Count Systems Initiative, which set examiner production goals. Has that system improved productivity in your view? Yes, sir. I think it was an initiative originally uh, instituted by Mr. Kapos, requested because he wanted to accomplish two things. One was to provide more time for examiners to examine patent applications so that we would be able to decrease attrition and increase quality. Uh, the other issue was to uh, be able to, he, he wanted to decrease the incentives for what are called uh, RCEs. And so we what are went to discussions to try and, and work out with the agency how to do that. What are the RCEs? Those are requests for continued examination. And basically when a, a, when a uh, applicant has gotten to the end of the round of prosecution, if they want to continue to keep the case alive and continue prosecution, they can pay for an RCE and it reopens the prosecution of the case. Now, let me ask you uh, about recommendations made in the uh, July 2013 16 page report addressing the reported telework abuse. Uh, have any of those been implemented and wh where do we stand with them now? We've, we've done a number of things. And I want to make it clear that POPA and the agency have been working together for years now trying to address the issues that face the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. This is just one of many. We've, you know, Congress has been on our backs about the backlog for quite some time. We are effectively addressing that. We are, uh, we are effectively addressing attrition with things like telework. And, and being able to uh, hire examiners. Keep in mind, examiners are a very expensive commodity. Uh, it takes a lot of time and money to train an examiner, a minimum, uh, well, basically, usually about six years and somewhere, you know, upwards of half a million dollars. If we're sitting here losing them, and we were for many, many years, we had to hire two examiners for every one we kept, we were spending, you know, tremendous numbers, amounts of money in order to do that. So we've created systems now 
that have reduced our attrition to negligible levels. And by so doing, we keep these people, they move up through the grades, and they m increase their productivity, and that's what's allowed us to bring down the backlog of, of 750,000 plus but, cases. But do you have enough uh, support and equipment and personnel to identify poor performers to take corrective action where necessary? I absolutely think we do. Uh, not to want to be flip, sir, but frankly, if the agency wasn't taking actions like that and couldn't track people like that, the union wouldn't really have much of a need of existence because a great deal of our time is spent representing employees who have gotten into trouble, and we've got to look and see what's the, what's the cause and where, what we have to do, work with the agency to try and solve the problem and, and uh, get the okay. back Thanks. on good behavior. Thank you so much. Uh, let me ask the commissioner, uh, Ms. Focarino, uh, has the opportunity uh, to telework help you retain the most qualified examiners? Yes, thank you for that question. It has very much helped us increase the opportunity. As you heard in my testimony, we have more than doubled the size of our patent examining course. So we currently have about 8,500 patent examiners, and they are helping us reduce the backlog and reduce pendency so that we're continuing to work towards our goal of 10-month first action pendency and 20-month total pendency. And the longer we retain these examiners, the more experience they get, the higher quality work product they put out. And so it's critical that we retain them because in order to retrain them, people uh, as new hires is extremely expensive to the agency. Mm -hmm. Let me go to uh, Ms. Keplinger now. How does uh, the uh, patent counselor, uh, the patent public advisory council, PPAC, work with unions to establish an effective approach regarding a number of aspects of the uh, patent operations and implications for patent applicants and the public? Uh, there are two union representatives on the PPAC. Mr. Budens is one, and there's uh, a Catherine Faint, who's from another union also, is on the PPAC. And so in collaboration, we look at the data and the things that are not working so well and try together to find ways to address changes that could be made within the system and within the patent office that might make for better opportunities for applicants. Thank you for your response. My time is up, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. We now go to Congressman Marino. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We've heard a lot of good things of what happens uh, in, uh, with the, our federal employees uh, in the patents office, in, in uh, trademark office, and I agree with most of it. But I haven't heard yet what, if anything, and perhaps someone can educate me on this. We'll, we'll start with you, Mr. Zinzer. You're handling the investigation, uh, the inquiries at this point. And we have over 600,000 patents backlogged. We have paralegals who say they didn't have enough work, but actually, in my opinion, as a prosecutor, not only as a state prosecutor, but as a federal prosecutor, there, seem to, there appears to be uh, fraud and theft uh, by a, a small number of people, but nonetheless, it seems to have appeared. And pursuant to the U.S. Code Title 18, Part 1, let me go through a list of crimes, starting in Chapter 19, with uh, Section 19, conspiracy, Section 31, embezzlement and theft, Section 47, mail fraud and other fraud offenses, Section 63, mail fraud and other fraud offenses pursuant to the specific act, uh, Section 73, obstruction of justice, Section 101, records and reports, and of course Section 1001, lying to federal investigators. And I'm sure I am missing something here. And uh, these crimes uh, totaled, uh, combined, uh, were our, uh, the penalty is decades in prison, in prison and uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines. Are we pursuing the investigation in any way, shape, or form to prosecute these people if the evidence is there? 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Marino. I, I would say that there are individual cases that we are pursuing, and if the evidence leads us there, we will refer them for prosecution. I think one of the biggest problems we have along those lines is that the management at PTO has been basically complicit. If you look at the Patent Trial and Appeal Board matter, yeah. those managers knew exactly what was happening with their paralegals, that there wasn't sufficient work, directed them to enter their time the way they did, and the employees were following their supervisor's instructions. That kind of uh, decision or complicity by the management sure. makes it very difficult to prosecute a case. I, I understand that, and I asked a question in the form that I did beginning with you because of the procedures that you have to go through, and I was aware of the uh, lack of cooperation that you were, you were getting and the, uh, the managers being complicit. But certainly the managers need to be held accountable. And let's face it, I was in private industry until I was 30. Uh, people know when they're doing something wrong, particularly when they're getting paid to do nothing. So I would hope, I would hope that given the fact that some employee says, well, my manager allowed me to do that, is like saying that uh, you know the person driving the getaway car in the bank in a bank robbery is saying, well, you know something, uh, I just went along for the ride. I really didn't point the gun at the bank teller and say, give me the money. So we have to get down to the basis here, and the American people are sick and tired of this occurring, and the bureaucrats in the system just getting away with this. It would not occur in private industry, not at all. And if it, if it were, I prosecuted people uh, in private industry and also in the federal government for doing the same thing. Uh, Ms. Uh, Focarino, could you please expand a little bit uh, or answer uh, my question pursuing criminal prosecution? And please don't tell me that someone said, well, my boss told me to do it. So as soon as the OIG referred uh, the complaints in 2013 regarding the underutilized paralegals in the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, the agency did take immediate action and has made significant progress towards avoiding the issues raised by the IG. Namely, we submitted a report to the IG just recently in September. We implemented a third party consultant's recommended changes. We brought in an outside consultant and they did a thorough review. Okay, let me interrupt you. I understand the review and the changes that you made. My focus is primarily is are those, are, are those individuals that were getting money for doing nothing going to be prosecuted if the evidence is there? Sir, I don't know the answer to that. You don't know if the evidence is there that you wouldn't assist in complaining to a law enforcement agency that they should be prosecuted? Yes as or no? I, as I said, we submitted our report just recently to the OIG. We've concluded our recommendation. The well, as you being a manager over there, wouldn't, I, would, I would like to think that someone in charge would let the American people know that this is not, we are not going to tolerate this in my department, in, in my agency. Can I, can I count on that? So those managers are no longer in their positions in the past. But they're still working, aren't they? And they're still getting paid, and they still stole money from the taxpayers, and nothing's being done about it? They were, performance actions were taken against these individuals. It's sir. theft. It's stealing dollars from the American people. Performance action was taken, so they get shuffled into some other position, and we do nothing about it. It's outrageous. I see my time is about gone, and I yield back. I think the gentleman uh, for the IG could also answer that question. If the same information that was asked came to your attention, what would be your normal procedure, if you don't mind? Well, we would refer matters to the U.S. Attorney's Office to, de to get a determination whether the case was uh, one that married prosecution. I think that's what the former U.S. Attorney was getting at. Yeah. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Maryland. Thank you very much. Coming. Following up right on that, so would it go with a recommendation? In other words, if you were referring it, what, would, you, would there be a recommendation or you just say, Here, here's the evidence? Well, you generally... Uh, if you were to refer it, that's... Go ahead. Yes, sir. There are cases where you take them to the prosecutor because you're obligated to do that. Of course. You, you don't think the evidence would really uh, get the prosecutor to take the case. There are cases where you, were, where you would push very hard for a prosecution. We've done that. Yes, sir. Very well. Commissioner, I want to thank you for being here today. The PTO's telework program has been a uh, model for the federal government, and we want to ensure that 
it is managed effectively and efficiently. To date, the telework program has helped the agency recruit and retain, as you've already testified, a highly skilled workforce, and it has saved the agency millions of dollars. I am I'm troubled, however, by the findings of your investigation, which identified instances of time and attendance abuse by some of your examiners. As I understand it, uh, the July 8, 2013 report detailed five cases of examiners who claimed time they apparently did not work. Are you familiar? Are you familiar? I am. Keep your voice up, please. For instance, the report describes one examiner who received more than $12,000 for about 265 hours of fraudulently claimed time, and another examiner who received about $1,300 for 25 hours of fraudulently claimed time. Commissioner, has the PTO taken disciplinary action against these five uh, employees? And if so, what actions were taken? Thank you for the question, uh, Congressman. The individuals identified in the original draft report who were found to have committed time and attendance violations were disciplined. One was removed, two were suspended, and one received a letter of counseling. Mm -hmm. The fifth case was never referred to our employee relations, and the individual referred to in one of the interviews was never identified. Therefore, no action could be taken. And I would also like to point out that of these cases, only two of them were teleworking employees. I think somebody testified a little bit earlier, I can't remember who it was, who said that it's not, I mean, you don't necessarily uh, say, assume that the subjects of these cases are tele teleworkers, is that right? That's correct. So, you, in other words, you have who said that? Somebody, yeah. So it may be they may or may not be. Is that right? That's right. But you're saying out of these, this five, two, to two your knowledge, right. were teleworkers. Uh, is that right? That's correct. Um, now, has the PTO experienced a substantial increase of time and attendance misconduct? since establishing the telework program. Do you know? I don't believe that there's been a significant increase in time and attendance misconduct, but any active misconduct related to time and in, in, in attendance is unacceptable. And when those situations come to our attention, we take action and we um, administer the appropriate discipline. Um, now, going back to you, Mr. Zunz, I'm going to come right back to you, Commissioner, but to you. You know, one of the things that we have seen in, in our committee as folks have, for some agencies have come before us, um, we've seen um, almost a culture being developed, um, slowly but surely, of sometimes complacency. We, uh, we saw that with the Secret Service uh, and inefficiency uh, in other agencies. But, I mean, is there, do you feel like this is a cultural, uh, culture is being developed here, or do you think these are aberrations? Sir, I think the interviews that were conducted by the employee relations staff at PTO reflect that there is a cultural issue, that somehow the signal has come down, you know, from the senior levels that they do not want to pursue uh, time and attendance abuse to the point where they're going to go and seek additional records and data to help uh, make those cases. Now, did you hear that, Commissioner? Did you hear what he just said? I did, I did hear that. I mean, what you, I mean, what, do you agree with that? I do not agree with that. And why don't you? Any single case of misconduct is unacceptable to us. And when they come to our attention, we take action. All right. Well, the PTO identified eight recommendations to improve its telework program and is currently in the process of implementing those recommendations. Commissioner, can you give us an update on where the agency is in that process and when do you expect all eight recommendations to be complete? Right. So thank you for the question, Congressman. So let me point out that even after we received the anonymous letters in the summer of 2012, we started taking action. We instructed all of our managers concerning time and attendance procedures, and we included guidance on time and, uh, and attendance abuse indicators so that they could be more readily spotted. We also reached an agreement with the union, which included mandatory use of collaboration tools for full-time teleworkers. Since the investigative report was submitted to the IG in, in July of 2013, we started a pilot to reduce the incidence of end loading, which you've heard discussed earlier today. 
We started an initiative to develop more preventive measures to reduce employee misconduct. We started uh, an employee disciplinary process that looks at the whole conduct process to make sure that employee misconduct is addressed and it is addressed consistently across a very large workforce. We've re revised the examiner timeliness or docket management that Mr. Budens has referred to. We've removed the auto counting privilege for examiners that have shown to abuse it. And we've created a central repository of our policies and procedures for our supervisors because we found in certain circumstances where we did have policies in place, like accessing records for examiners, those policies were not known to all of our supervisors. So we have to make a concerted effort to make sure that we have easy access, a centralized location, and that our managers are trained on these processes and procedures regularly. My time has expired. Let me just ask you one thing. I lost count. There were eight. Did you, so did, are you, have you dealt with all eight? We have implemented all re eight recommendations, and as a matter of fact, the, of the 15 in that initial draft report, 13 of the 15 recommendations have been implemented, with only two not being implemented because they do not make good business sense. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. Uh, if, if the gentleman allow me to ask a clarifying question. You said p more or less people lost their privilege to do auto count if they were shown to have abused. Yes, sir. Could you describe for us what that abuse means, the numbers, so we'd understand why most people apparently still get auto count and what it means? Right. So examiners, when they reach a certain grade level or are given the privilege of submitting their own work for credit with just cursory review because that goes along with their level of experience. Some examiners have been found to be submitting work that is not complete, that has several errors that need to be corrected, and they result in many returns that you heard Mr. Budens refer to. And we have suspended that privilege for those examiners. Hmm. I, I thank the gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now we now go to the other patent holder here uh, on the dais, Mr. Massey, the gentleman from Kentucky.